name is Monica Fabianska and I am uh, the curator of the exhibition currently on view at uh, Thomas Urban Gallery in New York, uh, the exhibition titled Echo Feminisms. Uh, this series of, this, this is the second in a series of three conversations uh, with the artists participating in the exhibition and our special guests on what echo feminism um, this is the second conversation in a, in a series. We had the first one last week and uh, uh, the following Wednesday at 6.30 p.m. we will have uh, the last in the series uh, of these conversations. I wanted to uh, greet uh, our guests, Aviva Rahmani, Jessica Segal and Sonia kaliher Combs, who are artists in the exhibition, as well as Candice Hopkins, uh, curator and writer, our special guest tonight. I will read your biographies and introduce you properly uh, in due course. Um, First of all, I, I addressed recordings and I also want to tell you how we will proceed. We will have the conversation for about an hour, maybe an hour, 10 minutes, and the rest of the time until 8 p.m. will be devoted to the Q&A session. I will be reading your questions in the chat channel. If you go down to your screens, you will see the chat. Please use it for the questions and not for other uh, ideas at this, uh, at this point, because it is quite difficult for me to find questions, and especially if they are very long. Um, I may got entangled in them, so uh, please make make them make them work up, workable. But think of them throughout the whole conversations. I will I will try to read as many um, as I only can to give you all voice. Um, Without further ado, I wanted to um, acknowledge the presence of Thomas Urban, who is the owner and the founder of, of the gallery. Um, uh, many artists said that before me that uh, there are reasons to say this is not a usual gallery and I can only uh, repeat it after them if I wouldn't have my own opinion on that. No, this is not quite a usual gallery. It's a small gallery that took on itself this en enormous task of putting together uh, a complex uh, um, a co and complicated exhibition at, a, at an absolutely impossible time and created a vessel for us uh, in which we could survive this very difficult time, but also a platform for all of us to discuss and to have uh, the dialogue in the ecologically minded art community. Thomas, would you like to say something? Yeah, I would like to welcome everybody and to say it's a really pleasure for me to have this exhibition here. I would also, I would like to really state that a big deal of this exhibition and its possibilities and coming together, we owe to Monica, who has been fervent in bringing everything to fruition, in following on each lead, conceptualizing the exhibition, and um, you know, bringing all these various threads, which I discover are a multitude and many, many layered threads together into a conclusive and conceptually as well as intellectually co um, cohesive uh, whole. So Monica, I can only thank you very, very much for doing this. The gallery itself is, as you said, a vessel we could have never done that. So all the, uh, you know, of course we, we help this organization, etc. but uh, the show itself, we really owe it to you and we thank you very much. Tyler, the whole thing. Thank you, Thomas. Um, uh, I won't make an, I, can you hear me? Yes. yes. Okay. I won't uh, do any introduction to the exhibition. I did it last time, so you will be able to listen to it. There are a lot of printed materials and I want to make uh, my presence here as short as possible, give, uh, giving as much airtime as I can to our guests. Um, the only one thing that I wanted to say is that uh, the exhibition proposes uh, a reflection about the term uh, ecofeminism. And of course, I, as a feminist art historian, um, start from, uh, from what feminist artists did in 1970s, uh, discussing the ideas of ecology um, and how, how they understood the intersectionality of the abuse of nature, the abuse of women, the abuse of people of color. And I was... Um, perplexed by the fact that we know their works very, very little, but many of them with, you know, some of them are dated, but many of them could be uh, created two weeks ago. And I thought that it would be important to bring them to the conversation today and see whether we can use the same term um, in any way in relation to the art being created today. 
And we have to remember, of course, that there is no literal translation possible because uh, not only the situation of women uh, on the art market, but also our concept of gender is entirely different than it was 50 years ago. Um, and um, there, there is no there is no one-to-one -one translation. But I wanted to, to to bring us all to the subject and simply create a, create a dialogue um, um, around these ideas. Um, I will only say that um, as long as our language and our cultures are still gendered and we use the terms as uh, mother nature or mother earth, I think that this discussion uh, is justified and needed and interesting. So without further ado, I wanted to first introduce our special guest, Candice Hopkins. Uh, I am particularly grateful to her for accepting our late invitation. She is a curator and writer and a citizen of Karkros Tagish First Nation. She lives between Albuquerque, New Mexico and Toronto, Canada. She's senior curator of the 2019 and 2021 editions of the Toronto Biennial of Art. Candice Hopkins was co-curator of major exhibitions, including the Canadian Pavilion for the 58th Venice Biennial, featuring the media art collective Isuma, which I was uh, lucky to see. Hopkins uh, was also um, uh, the co-curator of um, 2018 site Santa Fe Biennial, Casa Tomada, Documenta 14 in Athens, Greece, and Kassel, Germany. Sakahan, International Indigenous Art, and Close Encounters, The Next 500 Years. Her writing is published widely, and her recent essays and presentations include The Appropriation Debates, or The Gallows of History, for MIT Press, Outlawed Social Life, for South as a State of Mind, and The Gilded Gaze, Wealth and Economies of the Colonial Frontier, on the Colonial Frontier, for the Documenta 14, reader. Candice, we're honored to have you with us. Uh, but I will first ask the three artists to introduce us into their works in the exhibition. And the first of them will be Aviva Rahmani, who exhibits, publishes, and presents internationally. Her project, The Blue Tree Symphony, started in 2015 and ongoing, legally challenges expanding fossil fuel infrastructures with copyrighted and sonified installations across miles of North America. Her work has been included in exhibitions at the Independent Museum of Contemporary Art Cyprus, the Boulder Museum of Contemporary Art in Colorado, the Hudson River Museum, New York, the Cincinnati Center for Contemporary Art, Ohio, and the Joseph Boys 100. Her work has won numerous grants, fellowships, and been written about internationally. She is an affiliate with the Institute for Arctic and Alpine Research at the University of Colorado at Boulder, gained her PhD from the University of Plymouth in Great Britain, and received her BFA and MFA at the California Institute of the Arts. She's currently completing a residency with the Lower Manhattan Cultural Council on Governors. Island. Aviva, it's a pleasure to have you. It's to you. Thank you. And I can only echo my thanks to you, Monica, to Tomas, to Tyler, to the other artists who are here, and to Candace, who's joining us today. I'm going to start by talking about the work that's in the gallery, which was called Physical Education from 1973. And I'm going to describe the instructions for the performance. It was a beautiful Southern California spring day in 1973, and I set out with my friend Marilyn Immersion with the following instructions that had been written and printed for performers. One, each person takes a plastic baggie and a plastic spoon. Performers go to a water fountain or sink in an academic institution. Fill the baggie half full of fresh water and seal it. Drive to the ocean. Stop three times en route. At each stop, leave a teaspoon of the fresh water from the baggie at the side of the road and replace it each time with a teaspoon of earth from the site. Reseal the baggie and continue driving. Two. At the ocean, get out of the car and find some very dry sand. Pour the earth and water mixture out onto the dry sand. Walk to the water and refill the baggie half full with seawater and seal it. 
return to the car, drive back to the original institution, stop three times en route at the side of the road again, leave behind a teaspoon of seawater at each site and gather a teaspoon of earth to replace the seawater in the baggie, reseal the baggie each time. On returning to the institution, take the baggie to a bathroom, pour the remaining seawater and arable soil mixture down the bathroom toilet, flush the toilet, discard the plastic spoon, discard the baggie. A variation, use a special spoon to transfer the mixture of earth and water and keep the spoon. So the poetic tone of those instructions was something that I had learned from Alan Capro, for, for whom I was TAing at CalArts then. And what we spoke about a lot was the idea that the performances we were trying to design were intended to be models of another kind of thinking. I was working in conceptual forms, but still loved beauty in my imagery. The visuals, particularly the emptying of the water into dirt, sand, and the toilet, were intentionally feminist vaginal metaphors. They critiqued our wasteful disposal of water and soil, the creation of plastic waste, and they explored spatial relationships over geographic distances, and above all, the casual way women, especially then, were discarded and our sexuality was degraded. The performance ritual was a critique of the system that wastes resources and people. It was a sketch for modeling systems and systems change as a form of sculpture I continue to develop to this day in my practice. And Monica, do you want me to go on to ghost nets? Whatever you want to tell us, Aviva. Okay. Tyler, if you have that image from Ghost Nets, you could bring that up, please. Okay. In Ghost Nets from 1990 to 2000, I progressed from witness to interventionist in degradation. I bought a coastal town dump in Maine and over 10 years restored it to flourishing wetlands while living on the site. I used my practice to model designing systems change and land restoration as sculpture. In this slide, you can see both the original site and a detail of the restored habitat from a time-lapse film taken in spring 2010 in the inset. And if you want to see the whole film, you can just go to my website and it's on the top page at www.ghostnets.com. And I think that's the introduction to my work. Thank you, thank you very much. Uh, Tyler, if you could take down the images and let, and let more people in, because I know that this is uh, contradictory and they are waiting in line, so let's do both. As I am reading um, uh, Sonia Calera Combs bio, you can let more people in and then we will jump to, to her images. Sonia Kelleher Combs is an artist of mixed descent, Inupiaq from the north slope of, At of Alaska, Athabascan from the interior, German and Irish. She uses imagery and symbols that speak about culture and the life of her ancestors and marginalization and the struggles of indigenous people. She participated in numerous group exhibitions, including an Renwick Gallery, Smithsonian American Art Museum, Washington, DC in 2020, Minneapolis Institute of Art 2019, Corundu Museum, Rovaniemi, Finland, John Jay College, uh, New York City, which was my exhibition. Uh, and I was, that's, that's when I met Sonia. Um, Northern Norway Art Museum in Tromsø, North America Native Museum in Zurich, National Gallery of Canada, Ottawa, National Museum of the American Indian in New York City, Museum of Art and Design also in New York City, Chingyun International Craft Biennial uh, in South Korea. And her sole exhibitions include Minus Space in Brooklyn last year, the Northern Norway Art Museum in Svalbard, Norway 2018, Institute of American Indian Art, Santa Fe, Anchorage Museum of History and Art in Anchorage, and Alaska State Museum in Juneau. Sonia, it's so good to have you with us, and I'm so happy that we have the connection.
Tyler, can you unmute Sonia? Um, I, I don't have her mute. I got, it. I got it. Sorry about that. Perfect. <laughs> I just didn't want my dogs in the background. Um, so thank you so much, Monica and Thomas. And so happy to see all of your lovely faces um, and happy to share my work with you. So uh, if you can hear uh, Mark Polar Bear, that would be great. So this is the piece that's in um, the exhibition. And it's um, a piece that I did for the show in New York at Minus Space. And I've been doing a number of series um, called Mark. And Mark is a series commenting on both the endangered state of the natural world of Alaska and beyond. And I've just recently started using flags. But um, so a mark is a visible impression or trace on something. Um, it's a line, a dent, a stain, a bruise. It is a badge, a brand or other visible sign assumed or imposed. And lastly, it is a sign, a banner and dividing line. Um, Mark Polar Bear um, particularly addresses uh, my concern for the environment and climate change and the havoc seesaw politics um, plays as and especially when it comes to um, indigenous lands. And um, I really kind of come from this place of, uh, of our understanding of our relationship to the land and to each other. And um, it is composed of an American flag. Uh, I think it's two feet by three feet, somewhere in there. And polar bear fur and gel medium, which is a plastic medium that is added to acrylic paint to um, give body to paint. I've been using that medium as a synthetic skin um, for over 20 years now. It's, it's uh, also a commentary on our use of plastics in the environment. Um, so do we have any more images of that or is that the, okay, here, this is, a, this is another piece. So my work is really grounded in um, my reality, my relationship to place and, and to uh, people and to the natural world. It's so a blue cord blue aeon is from an exhibition called the plastic gyre it was an exhibition that began with it as an expedition to collect garbage on the coasts of alaska and so i harvested that rope and it's half encased in uh walrus intestine it's being reclaimed back to the natural world um and i'll read you a statement about this piece in particular Growing up in rural Alaska with Alaska native values, it is an unspoken truth. You take care of all that you harvest. You respect and honor what provides for you, your family and community. You take care of each other. Today, I wonder what has gone so wrong that our shores are filling with the waste of others. Alaska natives are innovative people recycling discarded items, sharing used materials, never throwing away something that might be needed by another. I think this is a wonderful and beautiful, and it was a really amazing way to grow up. And I still feel it in my heart that this is, um, this is the way that we should be. Um, so let's go to the next one, Tyler. This is from a series called Remnant. Um, and it is, uh, a series meant to comment on the threatened state of the natural environment, and not just of Alaska, of, of everywhere. Um, it's a location where the folly of our human-centric approach to industry is achingly clear. Within these works, the viewer is surrounded by fragments and scraps of the world of the North. Bits and pieces of animal hide, hair, clothing, and other detritus submerged in synthetic media like so many specimens from a way of life that no longer exists. Remnant invites the viewer into a dialogue that exposes the tenuousness of our existence. And um, this piece is Mark, another series um, from the Polar Bear Mark series. And it's um, seal, caribou, muskox, beaver, and polar bear. Some of these, um, scraps of fur that were given to me. Some of them were harvested for food for our family. And um, I've uh, put this mark within them to express uh, man's need to um, 
exploit, consume, especially Western, from a Western perspective, um, more, more, more. Um, so we can move on to, for that one. We'll, have, we'll talk more about that idea. So Orange Curl, um, this piece was in Sakahan, the first uh, quintennial that um, Candace um, uh, curated, was a, a curator in. So Orange Curl, um, this is all plastic. Um, so repetition and serialization are common throughout my work. This is how we learn. This is how I learned. We were given a scrap of material. And we spend time practicing with our mother or our grandmother till we get it right. I tend to explore an idea as many times as necessary to capture it. The series curl is simple. We are all related, more similar than we are different. The imagery that makes up the curl series is loosely, loosely based on a family parka sleeve pattern. The transformation of a sleeve standing next to each other into a statement about our relationship to each other. Orange curl also addresses ideas about the genetic modification of salmon and microplastics altering the DNA of salmon, which eventually we eat, which will eventually change our DNA. Um, and then let's go to a fun picture. Here we are. This is just from yesterday or day before yesterday. We're cutting salmon to smoke it and jar it for the winter. And right now is a really important time of the year. Um, we're all harvesting for the winter. And um, we can go ahead and go to the next one. And this is me capturing, getting this, harvesting the salmon. I think this might have been like at 2 a.m. a couple on Saturday night. So this is where I am right now. So that's all I have. Thank you so much. This is beautiful, really. Um, uh, uh, Tyler, check if you don't need to let more people in. And in the meantime, I will introduce our third artist, uh, Jessica Segal. Uh, Jessica is a multidisciplinary artist based in uh, Brooklyn, New York. Uh, her work has been screened and exhibited internationally, including the Fries Museum, the Havana Biennial, the National Gallery of Indonesia, uh, the Queens Museum of Art in New York, the Aldrich Contemporary Art Museum, the Inside Art Museum, Oud, sorry, Oud Museum, the Museum of Contemporary Art in Vojvodina, the Mongolian National Modern Art Gallery, the National Museum of Jewish um, American History, and the National Symposium for Electronic Art. Tagal received grants from the Paula Krasner Foundation, the Rema Hortman Foundation, New York Foundation for the Arts, New York State Council on the Arts, the Harper Foundation, and Art Matters, and attended residences at Princeton University, the Van Eyck Academy, the McDowell Colony, and Skohegan. Her work has been featured in Cabinet Magazine, The New York Times, Sculpture Magazine, Moose, and Art in America. She received her BA from Bard College and MFA from Columbia University. And Jessica is uh, uh, today in Nevada where she shoots for her new project. We're very happy we have a good connection with her, Jessica. Hello, yeah, can you hear me? Yes. Great. Uh, also, yeah, I'm very happy to be here. Um, and thank you to everyone hosting and the other artists um, that I feel a lot of alliance with in the places and um, thought processes and processes in making the work um, here. Um, yeah, I have just uh, completed a new project in Death Valley and I wanted to uh, talk specifically about the works in the show um, that incorporate my work incorporates sculpture. It's interspecies sculpture designed for both human and animal uh, habitation or use value. And then also endurance performance, um, kind of putting both the body at risk in extreme temperatures and also being in an, an environment that also is vulnerable in itself, um, sort of in the legacy of endurance performance, but thinking about, uh, again, future climates and acclimation and survival tactics kind of taking uh, endurance performance into that realm. Um, so I do have, uh, I have two pieces in the gallery. Um, this image that you're seeing here is Hugh and B flat, um, kind of a pun name for a sculpture, which is a grand piano, which um, I colonized with a hive of honeybees. Uh, so what you see here, uh, this image here is from Socrates Sculpture Park for their 25th anniversary. And um, you see a, 
a, a grand piano kind of held upright and I gutted the inside and brought in a hive of honeybees to live in the piano for the season. And while they were in there, um, sort of entering and leaving the hive to forage, they would um, pluck the strings, which was played on a live feed, a live audio feed that the audience could um, listen to and kind of hear the harmonic dissonance between um, what I saw as the piano, sort of the ultimate structure of, of harmony and something that's been projected philosophically onto bees throughout time from Steiner to the Nazi party, thinking about bees as the highest order of harmony and cooperation. Um, and then you get to hear the actual organic kind of movement of the hive of bees um, outside of our, our projection onto what it would sound like. Um, here you can see on the right, there's somebody listening to the live feed of the bees uh, inside the piano. This piece then moved on to Swale, uh, one of Mary Mattingly's pieces, who is another artist in the show on ecofeminism. And then was shown as an indoor piece at, um, at uh, Tyler University in Philadelphia as an indoor hive. So it's moved around a few times. Um, it is not currently occupied by bees. Um, but the honeybee is a, a, it is an animal I've been working with uh, since 2015. Um, kind of working with the idea of building a hive. Uh, it's the last colonized animal um, by humans. And it is something as well that we can kind of understand they conform to a certain type of architecture. So we're able to build um, architecture for them where you can manage them. So in none of these works am I harvesting honey, but it is something that the bees will occupy because of the structure and because of the ventilation and the location. Um, so I think Tyler, if you move a little bit forward, I'm also showing another bee work. Um, which this, uh, this project here, this is another hive that I built that I situated inside um, the agricultural basin of California where they have the largest migration on earth, which is a kind of a human made um, migration of honeybees that go to February in California to pollinate the almonds um, in the deserts of the agricultural basin. So again, this is, this is a bed and this is something that could be used by bees during the daytime and in the nighttime could be used as an intimate space uh, for humans as a proposal. So um, because they're following the same diurnal cycle, the bees are asleep at night. And this is also something that could be shared um, in kind of understanding daily work and rest uh, and labor. Um, and, then I'll, and then I'll introduce the next work. Uh, so this, yeah, again, this is kind of sculpture and performance. And the other work that I have is an image here, um, which is a video still from a performance in Svalbard. I was seeing Sonia also had some work that was shown there, I believe. Um, so this is from 2011, uh, from a residency that I had uh, in Spitsbergen. And it's a performative piece that I produced there in part wearing this uh, kind of clothing and thinking about uh, taking this image kind of from colonial Spain and bringing it to uh, this kind of unincorporated territory of the Arctic. Uh, again, this costume also is, uh, maybe it looks fragile, but it's designed for the weather. Um, so everything is designed to be worn um, in sort of the Arctic degree. I was also interested in the space because um, it hosts the global seed vault, uh, which you can see on the next slide, um, which would be this kind of, right. So here I'm standing on top of the global seed vault, which is kind of a it's considered a universal free archive for seeds. Um, so any sort of agricultural crop that is uh, decimated by either man-made or natural means, uh, if one sends a sample into this library, it gets stored into the permafrost in the Arctic and can be kind of ideally uh, uh, kind of removed in the future to repopulate uh, agriculture for human use. Um, this is sponsored by the Norwegian government and Bill Gates as well. So it is privately owned, but it is open for anyone to contribute um, any seeds that they desire. And so um, these are performance stills. Uh, I guess you can see a bit of the video work, which again is a bit of uh, my methodology is kind of going into a place that's difficult for humans to inhabit that might be in human, inhabited by animals and other um, creatures, but uh, require a certain amount of uh, preparation for humans to be able to inhabit and then to kind of perform within the, the um, within the environment, within the limitations. 
Um, and this piece that you're watching was exhibited in a couple different ways in a sculptural installation where I um, used old refrigerator parts to kind of reconstruct an Arctic environment inside the gallery. So part of this is kind of bringing back this, bring, kind of going to far away places that are, that are you know, I'm privileged to enter, and kind of bringing that back into the art institutional space and finding the right environment for that to be um, exhibited. So for this piece, um, I took old refrigerators and kind of reconstructed them to kind of build ice and snow um, architecture in the gallery, as well as sound. Um, one relationship that I wanted to make was, again, kind of between this domestic space. Um, thinking about it in this context, it's a very, you know, feminized domestic space, but at the same time, the kind of fuels that are being used to uh, create the cold microclimates in our, you know, in our kitchens and in our homes are contributing to the melting of the Arctic directly. Um, yeah, and I can go into uh, more details questions later. Thank you so very much, Jessica. We, um, we will now get into the conversation mode and I will ask the questions that um, uh, help this conversation go, but I, I hope that um, you will all chime in and uh, uh, take, it, take it over from me as well. Um, first of all, because we will be addressing a lot of <clears throat> questions and issues uh, about indig indigeneity and the ideas of indigenous identity and practice in art uh, versus the legacy and the practice of white artists. I, I need to acknowledge and to say where I come to this conversation from to uh, make it clear for everyone. Uh, first of all, of course, I am white and I live in America and I uh, come to this conversation with the, with the understanding of my privilege of that position that is um, that is the legacy of other white people who came here before me. But I also need to be very careful saying that because uh, most of a lot of you know that uh, I was born in Europe and uh, more than this, I was born in Eastern Europe. So um, a place on earth where the concept of overseas colonies didn't really exist, but other forms of colonization of other peoples and tribes, as well as ethnic hatred and abuse of people uh, not based on color of the, on the color of skin, but rather on the creed or even of uh, of dialect, uh, where and are widely present. And I'm fully aware of them. But making this acknowledgement, I wanted just to make sure that my fellow Americans don't take me as somebody patronizing them, because my American passport is very fresh. It's only a year old. Um, so I wanted to everybody feels space in this conversation and everybody feels safe to ask questions that may sound not safe, just because only asking questions, we are moving forward. And I hope that no matter what our bloodline is and how complex in some cases it is, we can move forward. So my first question is to both um, Aviva and Sonia, and I hope that Candice will also uh, chime in. I'd like to ask you about um, how your understanding of abuse of both nature and women and native people come together in in your artworks, in your in your ever in your understanding of the world. Shall I jump in? Whichever wants whoever wants to, to speak first. Okay, thank you. So I think of ecofeminism as the analysis that is the response to ecocide. The legal arguments for ecocide began in 1972 and they conflated genocide and ecocide to take countries to tribunals in The Hague, <laughs> starting with the United States over Agent Orange in Vietnam. Parallels between rape and ecocide seemed obvious to me. Both violently violate the integrity of the victims. To go into more detail, I'm going to read a paragraph from the book that I'm just finishing on systems theory and art, basically. Permission to commit ecocide to benefit a privileged few parallels permission to rape with impunity. Both intend to render a population, ecosystem, or other species or individual compliant to domination, available for extraction, and ultimately liable to annihilation. Examples are found throughout the history of the world. 
patriarchal entitlements to exploit in the United Kingdom and the United States, for example, are codified in the King James Bible, where it was expressed as an inevitable and God-authorized policy of what came to be called manifest destiny. The English king then demanded that texts be written by his aristocratic priesthood who were dedicated to noble entitlements. But the Aramaic original mandate is to care for all life. That was mistranslated as dominion over all other life for the purpose of bolstering the monarchy. The colonial use of religion to serve manifest destiny made the rape of peoples and habitats inevitable across the globe. In the United States, it caused the genocide of native populations on a scale that dwarfed the actions of the Third Reich. The King James Bible expressed patriarchal entitlement as an inevitable and God authorized policy of what became manifest destiny. And that is the quote on topic. And how does it relate to your practice? Can you talk a little bit about that? I think my entire practice has been about trying to understand what is ecocide, how does it manifest, and how can it be resisted? I came to believe that there are elements of an art practice and in my own art practice that can not only identify the systems, but change the systems. And that became trigger point theory. I came to the idea that you could leverage ideas from physics to change the organization of agents in any system. You simply had to figure out where to intervene in the chaos and affect the first action. So for example, in ghost nets, I had to identify a piece of land in a large bioregion whose restoration I was convinced was going to affect the contiguity for many miles of the landscape along the Atlantic coast and the migratory bird fly zone. From doing that, I could extrapolate rules to apply to complex adaptive systems that eventually manifested in the Blue Tree Symphony and where to intervene in the legal process to arrest ecocide by fossil fuels. Yes, and I will even add that uh, what Aviva did was applying a lot of uh, PTSD uh, theory and, and, and understanding to um, trying to address nature and how nature can revive or can be healed from the trauma as, as women are, as women do. Sonia, uh, how about your, your practice and, and your thoughts on this subject? That is so, so great, Aviva. Thank you so much. Um, you know, it's so interesting. I, I don't think I really ever considered them directly linked, you know, on um, the land and um, abuse of, of women. I, I just know that, like, the work that I do is... Um, you know, come, comes from this experience, from my own personal experience, and, and um, which is what I, most of us do. But I think that um, when it comes to talking about, um, you know, the linking of them, I don't, I, I really can't um, say that there, I, there is um, a separation between both the land and the, and women and men, and we're all and the way that I approach it is we're all the same, you know, so I not like we take care of each other. It's reciprocal. Um, and, you know, like just an example of that is like over harvesting. That's a Western concept, accumulation and um, excess and consumption. And so when I'm thinking of, um, and Viva just totally hit it on the head from a wonderful historical perspective of, of how the, how these things have kind of um, exasperated, you know, gone, gone on and on and on through Manifest Destiny. I really feel like 
if we could just go back to the beginning and people, I think we're doing it now. I mean, look at the world is healing itself because of this pandemic, like the water is cleaner, the air is cleaner, all that stuff. Um, and it's because we're not running a hundred miles an hour towards some, uh, to get more, more, more. And, um, and if we could get back to that simple idea of taking care of each other and understanding all of these um, cause and effects would not be, you know, hopefully would not be happening. Um, the abuse of women and abuse of children. Um, I don't separate any of that or, or men. Um, so, and as far as the um, speaking to my practice, um, you know, I work in a series that a, a lot of them overlap. They're all talking about things that are important to me. Some, some can be joyful and some are really not so, um, they're, they're, the subject matter is more deep and dark and, and those are the things we have to say to get to another place and the dialogue and conversation are so important. So, yeah, I don't know. That's kind of what I'm doing. Thank you. Candice, would you like to chime in and uh, speak from your curatorial practice or writer's practice to this subject? Sure. Um, Aviva, thank you for those thoughts and also Sonia, of course. Um, Sonia and I have been di in dialogue for a number of years and I think also share some particular, um, I think, worldviews that come from where we grow up, which is um, from my side, predominantly matriarchal and matrilineal. So one of the things that might be interesting to think about or, or discuss is how or how not that aligns with feminism. Um, but Aviva, to, to your point, um, much of my writing practice is thinking about how colonialism operates as a system. It definitely operates as a system and it has uh, different stages, one of which uh, people have talked about a lot, which is settler colonialism. But now we're in the phase of extractive colonialism. And I think that it's very important to, kind of, to parse them out and to see how they operate and how they operate on us. Um, of course, you know, as you were, you were reading your quote, I was thinking about one of the early ways in which Indigenous people were dehumanized was to be not considered people at, at all, but to be considered akin to flora and fauna. And I think that that's kind of fascinating because it, in that dehumanization, it also, reiterated perhaps the kind of relationality that um, that we have but it also I think showed the kind of or, or proved the worldview of, of the idea that flora and fauna are things to also colonize and, and extract from. Um, but one thing that I wanted to say with regards to that and with regards to Indigenous perspectives because I think Monica this is why you're also interested in in particularly in Sonia's work and perhaps uh, my contribution to this discussion, uh, one thing that I've observed uh, in the last number of years, especially a lot of conversations around um, decolonial practices as it relates to the environment, is that again, I see a kind of cycle happening. And so there tends to be a turn to the indigenous in times of Western crisis. Um, and this is happening again, but the crisis now uh, unilaterally is understood as being environmental. Um, my question with regards to that is when you look at it over time, in the 60s there was a turn to the indigenous, particularly in American culture, in the counterculture movement, because I think that there was also a crisis of spirituality. Um, so now I'm thinking about, you know, what what is behind the turn and in fact, whose voices are being in, empowered in that turn. And what I'm seeing too is knowledge being extracted once again. Um, so I think that even in, in this decolonial turn, there is a kind of extractivist nature to it. And I wonder how, how we interrupt that. And I also wonder whether this is something that Sonia, whether you face in your practice and others face in their practice, because I think if we can't really attend to that, then, um, and sort of look deeper as to the reasons why, um, then, then I think that we can't really have the same kind of conversation. It ties perfectly to, uh, to one of my questions that I wanted to ask later, but I bring it now. You perfectly introduced it. And I think that me and many other people have uh, been asking themselves the same question. Uh, we are aware of the turning suddenly now to indigenous people uh, in looking for ideas to solve the crisis that we are in, but how do we do that ethically? Because 
we, ha we probably have to agree that it's a good idea to turn to indigenous people for that knowledge. Uh, um, maybe not, maybe we, we won't agree to this, but if we agree on that, so what's an ethical way, both in general terms, in society, but specifically in, in the art world, in the art community, because this is what we all do here in this conversation, right? We're curators, writers, artists. Mm -hmm. How do we, how do we uh, draw the fine line, I would say, between um, what I would call, call inspiration and appropriation, both artistic and spiritual. You tied it, uh, you, you hit in the, in the very right point where, where my question really is, um, Candice. Do you see such fine line at all? <laughs> I do. Well, uh, we, we all know that appropriation uh, relies on inequities of power, of course. Um, so that's something that needs to be addressed. But one way that I was thinking about uh, that question, Monica, and I wondered how others wanted to respond to this, is that um, is that the way that I grew up, I grew up with various protocols. So when you uh, fished or when you hunted a moose, my, my grandma was an amazing moose hunter, uh, there were certain protocols around um, that animal and what you did with that animal and the fact that you never ever uh, discarded any part of it, you know, even bones, uh, for example, or the nose. Uh, and if, if it was too much for your family, you gave it to others, but you also thanked the animal for giving you its life and you only took one. <laughs> so it, it, for me, I think part of it is, and the reason that I use that story is because if there's going to be any relation or true understanding Unless there's a shared understanding of what the protocols are, then of course there's going to be appropriation, even in inspiration. Um, but I, I, I feel like I've been talking quite a bit, so I wanted to turn it over. Sonia, would you like to speak to, to us about your perspective? Sure. I think definitely, Candice, it, it is about power. And um, I think that there's a really fine line. A lot of people want to define, they want to have a notebook that tells them a, B, C, D, this is how you do it. And it's really um, something that when you see it, it, I mean, when I see it, I, I know, I, I can see that it's appropriation. I know it is, you know, and a lot of times I think what's happening here, I'm just an example is like people are helicoptering in who have this experience for a day, two days, then they go out and, and really they, they think they're helping the community and you know addressing these these kinds of really complex issues and we could never i wanted to say this at the beginning it's like these questions are you could do multiple dissertations on them and you would never even scratch the surface so this is just a starting point but um ultimately um and i i think we've been calling it appreciation for appropriation um so I think that there is no way to um, somebody, I don't know who's gonna make this decision I, or, or make this pamphlet that tells us what is appropriation and what is appreciation. I think if you're um, doing something in such a way um, and it's not from your, your experience and imagination, you might ask yourself why, why you're using or doing you know, some particular, um, using some content or, you know, everybody thinks you can just take and grab it, the certain aspects of a culture or a way of life or value system. But if you haven't, if you don't understand it, there's no, um, if you don't really know where it comes from, I would never in a million years think that I could um, speak to something that is not my own personal experience, you know, that I don't um, have knowledge for. And so I always think it's really interesting that people feel like they can um, like put on a suit and be that person, you know. And I love the um, talking about the moose because when, where we come from, we there are definitely protocols, you know. And my mom is a really good hunter too, moose and mascots both. But, we didn't get one of those we wouldn't be able to survive our family wouldn't be able to you know survive when i was a child so it's you know it's it's really really you know um important i very much like what you said about drawing from personal experience 
Uh, but when you are a curator, you are very often in a situation where you are not supposed, you want to enter other territories to learn or to bring the knowledge to the others and to, again, create a possibility, a vessel for dialogue. And uh, I must say that I had a lot of uh, discussions with myself uh, preparing this exhibition, for example. I simply uh, found a lot of early projects uh, around the idea of goddess, uh, uh, the female uh, uh, goddess from early 1970s, dated in a way that it was touching in, in, in ways not necessarily um, easy or, or okay for me, the, the idea of cultural appropriation, but some of it was naivete, some of it was its time. So I also want to be very careful in, you know, looking back in time and trying to be smarter than other people who were before me. That's a very, I think that we're too easy tri triumphalistic in such situations. But anyway, I tried to choose the artworks where the artists were addressing their own background. So there are two works in the, in the exhibition that deal with the idea of spirituality and looking for a spirituality beyond rel Western religion systems. But one of them is made by a Turkish American artist, uh, uh, Bilga Friedlander, who looked at the Sumerian um, epos of Gilgamesh and basically digged in her own ancestry and, 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 uh, and history. Uh, the other is um, Anna Mendieta, who, 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 who looked at her own uh, background, but it's also, uh, it, this is even more complicated. I don't wanna, I don't wanna get it too, um, too far, um, but there is, a, there is a very interesting example in the exhibition um, uh, of an artwork by an artist who cannot speak uh, herself uh, now, and maybe it's also a good, uh, a good moment for me to bring her in, Elena Ilon, who is one of the artists in the show, died of uh, complications of COVID two months ago. And as much as I try, you know, there are artists who are alive, who take, par take part in, in, in the discussions are always more visible than those who are not anymore. And I should not um, be her voice, but um, I was always very attracted to a particular story uh, that she would repeat each time that I was asking her in our interviews about uh, the Earth Ambulance, the piece that is in the exhibition. And this was basically a, an ambulance that she named Earth Ambulance and went from Berkeley to New York City back in 1982, uh, doing a, a, a big ac uh, activist project um, um, from the perspective of addressing uh, the nuclear um, uh, contamination and stopping it several nuclear bases in the US and um, collecting and cleansing contaminant, contaminated soil. And of course, a lot of these bases were built on native territories. And this was a collaborative project. Elaine invited, I think, 12, uh, 11 women to it. And when she would tell me the story, and you know how you remember your own life, certain things you repeat, certain things are always different. And I heard this story many times. And each time she was telling me that, she would say, and then uh, in such and such uh, uh, um, reservation, an indigenous woman joined, woman joined us, Mary Fowler, and she would always take care to spell her first and last name and say, and she, uh, and we owed a lot to her understanding of what was done on those territories because she was our guide there. And the project doesn't carry uh, the, 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 any visual sign of indigenous culture, but, in the, but it carried the knowledge and Elaine acknowledged it. And correct me if I'm wrong, but I always thought it very in, inspiring example of how can we how can we acknowledge and how can we share, how can we learn? Yeah. You have your own, oh, Sonia wanted to say something. Acknowledging and collaborating, working with, those are so important. And, you know, there's so many instances I've seen where there's, you know, there'll be a, an artist that has, you know, a installation and they're, not, not just an artist, other, other kinds of organizations, they're coming back to help these people find you know, some lost knowledge, and, but then they don't acknowledge the people that were doing these, these different projects with them. 
or they just acknowledge them maybe by the tribe, which is, that is, that's the number one thing, you know, is, is to be able to um, give them, you know, to acknowledge them. Go ahead, Candice, you can go. Oh, and it, this is just a base level, but of course, um, think about what that work offers them. Um, you know, does it offer anything practicable, for example, um, because eco-terrorism is, is a reality in indigenous lands and communities, especially down where I am in Albuquerque, New Mexico, uh, living not only in Tiwa land, but on the edges of Navajo Nation and Laguna Pueblo, where um, the first uranium was actually found for the Manhattan Project. Um, a lot of those uh, first uranium mines um, in the 40s and 50s were never cleaned up because EPA or Environmental Protection Act uh, didn't allow them to and the companies went defunct. Um, so there's still uh, what they call yellow dirt there. Um, and there's still no acknowledgement of it because I think of a greater problem of um, what a colleague of mine just said in a great article in the New York Times that came out yesterday, um, the simultaneous presence and absence of indigenous people. And that was Paul Chot Smith writing about or speaking about an exhibition called uh, America, in fact. Um, so I think that simultaneous presence and absence works its way also into our projects as well. Um, where, uh, and I don't know, maybe this is, this is too much of a leap to your work, Jessica, but I was thinking about um, consent yeah, and collaboration. You know, you're collaborating with bees. Uh, is there ways of you know, creating a kind of sense of informed consent, uh, even in collaborations with insects, for example? Um, so that was something that I was thinking about as well, is it, this is about informed consent, but it's also about who has the voice and who takes, uh, who names themselves as the author? Right, right. Um, uh, we have an artist here who worked early on, who's a white artist, but worked uh, early on with indigenous people in her projects, I, for sure in 1990 in Ghost Nets Aviva, but probably also in 1970s. Could you tell, you know, it's, 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 again, I'm very careful about historical perspectives here, but could you tell us how you asked yourself these questions and how these collaborations look and what do you think about these ideas and these this issues that we deal with? Well, I think that Sonia and Candice touched on a lot of the incredibly uh, complicated and sensitive aspects of these questions. I, I wrote out a, a little timeline of how I had been involved with indigenous peoples and tried to learn, and I'll just read it out. <clears throat> I first began working with indigenous people in workshops in Southern California in 1976, but from 1990 to 2000, you're right, the entire duration of the Ghost Nets project, I studied with a particular woman who had been a student of the Plains Indians elders. She was white. Um, and she described what she was trying to teach me as sweet medicine, which is the medicine of uh, Plains women. Ghost Nets was launched with a traditional medicine wheel by Grandfather Thundercloud, uh, a Cherokee elder. And when I could, I studied and learned with other indigenous people and I was peoples. And in Ghost Nets, I became particularly interested in traditional environmental knowledge that Dennis Martinez was holding seminars for in the Society for Ecological Restoration from about uh, 1999 to 2005. This issue of inspiration versus appropriation was something that came to me really forcefully at the beginning of Ghost Nets. At that time, I started reading Ward Churchill and some of the other Native American authors who felt in some cases, they would rather see the knowledge die completely than allow it to be appropriated and abused by white people like myself who are interested in trying to understand. One of the things, one of the elders I spoke with told me that was incredibly helpful was, you can learn from us, but then go to your own tradition your own spiritual roots. And uh, it's taken me most of my life to think that through. I had a great uncle who was a chief rabbi in Safad in Palestine, 
which was then a center of Kabbalistic learning. And they have referred historically to Safad as the blue city because so many of the buildings were painted blue to represent water and sky. And that came to fascinate me. I began to think, well, maybe that's part of my DNA. What I learned more than anything from the elders that I studied with were ethical qualities that I had the opportunity to consider. And I'll, I'll just list some of them. Uh, first of all, humility, uh, empathy, love, respect, humility again, generosity, and other human qualities that uh, make me think of Winona LaDuke's book, uh, All My Family, where she relates to every species on earth as, um, was it Candace who spoke of a contract with insects? I thought that was fabulous. Um, one of the premises I've worked with in the Blue Tree Symphony has been the legal idea of the sacred home in eminent domain law and how that really should be about the sacred home of the earth that we share with all life. I just finished a workshop um, with an international group yesterday and we had several people who are working with indigenous groups including in Uganda and in Sweden with the Sami people. And in each case, when you have a white artist trying to work with or learn from an indigenous group, it, it gets really messy. And, and ultimately it comes back to introspection, I think. In the deepest level, what are my motives? When I think about copyright law, copyright law is based on wh who did the work? Well, I didn't do the work of the medicine wheel, that's for sure. <laughs> yeah, I was also thinking a lot about copyright as, a, as the most possible, uh, the most easy translation for most of the people for at least some boundaries for ethical behavior in this, in this world. Um, I have to change the subject because I'm looking nervously both at the watch and at Jessica Segal, who, uh, whom we need in this conversation, whom we invited, and I would like to switch a little bit the subject. I mean, there is a place, there are two more questions that I want to ask. So we are invading already the Q&A uh, session, but I hope uh, everyone will, will um, forgive us and I will ask you for a little bit shorter statements, but Jessica, uh, you use your time <laughs> uh, because you haven't been able to speak yet. So first of all, there is a connection, an incredible and wild uh, connection between Jessica's and Sonia's works in the exhibition. Both of them, uh, address the issues of, right, of animal rights and animals, but in a very different way that for some of the audience may even seem contradictory. And I have to uh, bring this question up for, not just for, uh, not for myself, but really on behalf of our audience and especially the children who come in. We had, uh, uh, we had children who came in and immediately asked, so who killed the bear? So I'd like to Sonia and, and Jessica to address the, the ideas of animal rights and, and in your work. Okay, well I, well, I could talk about bees at first, because I-, I Talk I about bees before we t talk about the bears. Yeah, uh, or unless, um, well, I wanted to respond to Candace's uh, provocation as well about this idea of consent and still kind of honeybees being uh, a colonized animal or the last sort of herd animal uh, species um, that's been in a way stewarded by humans. And one thing, one reason that I started working with them is because my work is concerned with the legality and illegality of animals and species and belonging, um, which I think has a very, um, I mean, to sort of even decide what's treated under like migratory bird species acts and what isn't dependent on how long they've been, uh, animals have been located into an area is a very sort of nostalgic viewpoint from a colonial lens. I think that these ideas of belonging and nature have to be more expanded. Um, we've created a very hostile planet for animals to live on. And if there are species that thrive within our like um, hostile climate, we're gonna have to start accepting those that, that 
cohabitate and flourish in the environment, agricultural and um, industrial climates that we create. But um, these, I also think are interesting. Um, they were illegal in New York City from 1999 to 2010. It's something that Giuliani um, banned beekeeping in New York City and they were kind of on a list from the Department of Health and Hygiene as a venomous animal. Um, of course, there were illegal beekeepers in New York City at that time. And then it was reinstated in 2010 when I started to um, take beekeeping lessons and kind of learning how to manage them. Um, they, have min they have minor consent in that if they don't like an environment, they can leave. That is, of course, a bit dangerous th to them to relocate an entire city. Um, but they are something which now um, are also being kind of... Um, well, in one sense, that illegality of the bees, I think, creates a fear and a misunderstanding and a misguidance when our relationship to an animal is maybe some childhood pain, minor pain versus their sort of contributions they can give uh, to the planet. Um, but for the most of their life in, this, in the United States, they're being shipped around from um, monocultural plantation to monocultural plantation and have very little say uh, into, into any sort of... Um, yeah, uh, any sort of like conscious decision as to where they would like to inhabit. Um, that is um, one thing. And then um, I did want to mention as well, in addition to Svalbard, uh, like there is an amount of work that I've done in the Arctic as well and spent some time in the no attack national reserve as well, um, which was, um, yeah, again, there's all these sort of different uh, corporate and um, and native and sort of colonial hunting interests in this territory that are kind of uh, somehow work together and at odds with one another. But I did find that um, it's interesting being in a place where you are outnumbered by the polar bears and sort of the different ways in which the polar bears are managed as a natural resource. Um, and in Svalbard, it is considered a murder to kill a polar bear, which I thought was interesting. If there's 3,000 polar bears and less humans inhabiting the space, any sort of killing of a polar bear is investigated as a, as a murder, um, which I wanted to bring up as well. Um, Sonia? So, there's so much to go on, but yeah, I want to hand over, yeah, hand over to Sonia. So um, that bear was, that, that bear hide was given to me by my uncle who harvested that bear. And it's an older hide that um, I, I had had for quite some time until I knew what I wanted to do with it. And a lot of times I, you know, we'll collect things and, um, and until I know what, you know, we never throw anything away. So my, when I started working with bones, my mom sent me everything she'd ever, ever hunted. I, she's, she has all of it and that I have more than I could possibly know what to do with. But um, it's so interesting, like this animal rights thing, because it's, um, it's like, I think we, I feel like if it's an ethical question, it really is. It's like how you approach your relationship to the land and to nature. We are nature, so I don't separate them. Um, and um, and as Candace said before, I could. It's it's the way that you. It is it is your relationship. We have protocols. We, you know, the way that we um, work with um, work within our family and 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 within within the landscape and and this place is um it's reciprocal you know we um i truly believe that um when you're harvesting um you, you show respect um whether it be animals plants birds fish all of it and um historically uh, my people did there was no word for art everything was embellished for a purpose an example of that is like in Inupiaq culture, there, there's certain um, symbols and patterns that would be added to our hunting implements, circle, circular form so that if an animal would know that, you know, once he was harvested, he would be able to return to the spirit world and come back. Um, um, a lot of ideas about reincarnation. Um, so there's a lot of, um, it's really complex, our relationship with the land and nature, and it's not something that I could like just go, you know, say right here, but I do, um, I, I appreciate these questions and the opportunity to kind of like delve into it a little bit. Um, and um, so I, yeah, it's, it's really, 
And I wanted to say something about um, the last, the bees being the last to be colonized. I, I suppose it could be colonized, but farmed fish is a huge problem in um, genetically modified fish and all of that. And, um, um, and we're gonna get a backlash of this, this kind of thing. But I know Candace, where she's from, they're dealing with you know, fish going into invasive species. I heard that there's humpies, pinks, that are normally a, a Pacific fish has been, um, is in Norway now, and it's coming from Russia side, and it's just crazy. There's all this crazy stuff going on. And our fish are dying because the, the oceans are too hot, and you know, they were airlifting salmon in Canada. You know, there's, there's so much, <laughs> but. Candice, do you want to chime in from your perspective? Um, yeah, I would just echo what's, what, what Sonia has been saying about uh, systems out of balance. Um, they're, they're definitely out of balance. And I think the biggest difference, of course, is that we didn't operate in a capitalist system. Um, even, you know, in my grandmother's generation, we, we had a very, very modest cash economy, but we still actually lived within a kind of barter and trade economy. And I think that that meant that you know, combined with the protocols of land that come from land. So that's, I think, something that I wanted to reiterate is, you know, the idea that somehow, and, and of course you can do this, you can learn from certain people, but, you know, your, your spirituality and your protocols come from the place where you're from. And uh, you can't really divorce it from, from that. And also the way that you work with, with, with animals and, and, harvesting even of, of plants. So I think that that's something really important to say is that, you know, for us, um, animals are not a commodity. And also to echo what you said, Sonia, um, something that, that I have as well, which I thought was really special is, um, I have all the scraps of fur that my mom had that she was using to make knits and uh, mukluks and things like that. And um, they, were, they were gifted to me after her passing. And those are things that we never, ever throw away. Um, so to, I think that everything, it's, it's a very different value system. And it's the question of, you know, can that value system be transposed or not, uh, especially in a, in, a, in a capitalist economy? Um, we won't answer this. We will go into a huge, huge discussion here. And I still wanted to give a little bit more time to Jessica, who had very little time to speak. And also looking at the clock and looking at the chat, there are many, many questions. I will now try to do, uh, to merge one of the questions that came with my last question, which I didn't ask, and which was about, uh, uh, let's start from the question that somebody answered, he asked here. Um, about ritual. Oh, there is a lot about ritual already here. Um, okay, so I will, I will paraphrase about, I will just ask you about the meaning of ritual in your work, but I will also make this, um, make this little note that uh, this is something very specific and very, very present in 1970s work uh, and 1980s when it comes to feminists dealing with environmental issues. I am not so sure it is so uh, widespread today. Uh, in my opinion, much less. What, what is an absolutely unifying theme today for the artists working with the subject are the ideas of how to mine, how to subvert, how to insert themselves into the ways that corporations, global corporations work, and how to address um, their working. And if I could just in one sentence give you the difference between 1970s and today within uh, how women address this work, this is, uh, this is the answer. But uh, I think there are elements of both and I would like to just, Jessica to talk a little bit about her practice and address both these issues about, of, of how, you, um, how you address corporations and, and, and about the meaning of ritual perhaps in your work. Yeah, um, well, I think, yeah, it's, Thinking about art, I think uh, I did want to bring that up a little bit and just sort of talk about, um, again, in a, maybe a legal sense, because I was interested in Aviva also talking about um, like the moral rights of the artist and sort of in her work, Blue Trees, and kind of what, what art can be done in order to create maybe a sacred space. I, I've become very interested in sort of what ways um, land art has almost unintentionally created um, national uh, like protected environmental space around which the view shed cannot be disturbed and kind of that almost um like a sanctifying 
uh, possibility of art and also the, um, the intellectual rights that come along with that and um, have found that just in the United States, um, property rights and ideas of privacy are just much more respected and stronger. And if that's something that I could try to embed and use in my work to somehow um, create a sanctuary for animals or land, it's kind of going in that direction. And so in my work, I have collaborated with a lot of uh, private companies. That's something I investigate, the sort of privatization of conservation um, in a way that commodities can be re regulated and protected as a natural resource. Um, I did want to bring that back as well into this idea of ecofeminism that you talked about in the sense that women also have been a natural resource that's been regulated and protected and commodified in terms of what's considered um, a natural resource in terms of women's labor that doesn't have to be paid, such as child rearing um, versus something that does, such as mining, going out and extracting, extracting the um, minerals from the soils. So in a sense, I mean, and the works that I've shown um, with the beekeeping bed that was in collaboration with a, a, bee, a beekeeper uh, or a brokerage company. And their whole job is to kind of place bees on property that is owned by farmers that are creating this monoculture crops in uh, California. And that's a way that I had access to this kind of really man-made temporal agricultural site that's causing so much ecological damage is kind of through actually the, the generosity <laughs> or sort of the yeah, being invited in through the sort of corporate owners of that space. Um, it's also something in my other work, I've worked with um, private wildlife reserves in order to access animals that I think, um, it, like exotic animals that are privately owned. It's an extension of the colonial legacy if you can't sort of own property in uh, Southeast Asia and Africa now, maybe you can extract the animals and kind of own them in a colonial sense. Um, and I've worked with the private owners of that to kind of have access to the space. And I have been creating my own sort of companies as well that have the legitimate like access over a space, absolute not the intent to harvest, but in order to uh, create sanctuary spaces. So I do think it's, I think it's something that when I think about collaboration, I think one can sort of work within the system to create structures that uh, can uh, maybe use the infrastructure that's there, but with a different intent. And that's been, that's been an investigation of mine in the artwork. And then along the way, creating these kind of poetic, uh, absurdist imagery <laughs> that sort of ends up in the gallery. So the ritual, I was thinking in your Svalbard piece, uh, this whole scene where you pour milk, it's, it is like mourning of, I don't know, the access to, what's, could, could you talk about this? Maybe I'm wrong. No, no, I was thinking about mourning and I was thinking about, um, I was thinking about this space that had never, that was always too harsh to ever be settled completely. It's only been sort of visited to be, like for the materials to be harvested. And um, yeah, thinking about, in a way, not necessarily the absence of, of like the culture, human culture there, but the end of human culture, especially in, in thinking about those global seed vaults, right? Like when would you need to go and sort of remove the seeds from this vault? what has to happen to human society. Um, it's only, seeds have been removed once. Um, I, and I believe uh, from Iraq at one point, sort of um, replant some crops that have been devastated in, in, in the warfare that's been happening. Um, but pouring the milk, again, there's this idea that that was just something spontaneous. So sometimes I just have to be in a place and experience it. And um, I can plan as much as I want, but once you're there, like being being somewhere and listening is something very different than having a predetermined notion of what one does. So, so the milk itself was a very, like this idea of nurturing and, and fertility that's being kind of spilled onto the ice. Yeah. When I look at the works of uh, the early feminists, I, I, I see that ritual is often, uh, often tied to the interest of these women in the natural cycle of life, the birth, the growth, the aging, the death, and just embracing, uh, embracing it also in the context of what, what's the work of art, what's the finished work of art, what's the masterpiece, uh, all of it. Um, Viva, could, could you talk a little bit of, 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 of ritual in your, from your perspective, in your art? Do you see it there? Well, I think most performances are rituals, but one of the things that we often talked about in the early 70s was, and the late 60s, 
was how much of a woman's life at that time, and I think to some extent still today, is intensely ritualized, determined by children, by a husband, by obligations to cook and forage for food. And I, one of the things that I know fascinated me about a lot of, not just indigenous cultures, but traditional cultures from around the world, is how much of that ritualization is around food and nurturing. So I'm not so sure about uh, the transition from when the emphasis moved from the home, the ritual within the home and how it was reflected in other works to other ideas. I think there's actually a connection between rituals and systems. But I suspect that as women became more able to move into the workforce, we were also, many of us became disconnected from those homemaking rituals. They were more a, an argument about who was going to take out the trash and then fitting in whatever you're going to fit in and getting the babysitter and so on and so forth. Um, but I think we still live by rituals. I know I do. I have a whole ritual from the moment I wake up in the morning until I go to sleep. Uh, the question is whether you're going to use that in some way. That probably doesn't answer your question, Monica. There is no one answer to any one question, but we made a perfect circle and now we have to ask uh, uh, Sonia and Candice, because of course ritual means entire, something entirely different within the indigenous uh, uh, culture and within the art that comes from it. Could, could you quickly comment on that as well? Quickly, on <laughs> something as large, I know. We don't hear Sonia, I think Sonia is speaking. Candice is also- I was, I was just telling Candice, go, go ahead Candice. Okay, I thought that that's what you were doing, Sonia. <laughs> Sorry. Um, I actually uh, wanted to pick up on something that, that Jessica said with regards to the rights to nature and maybe this will be a kind of circuitous way of answering the question. But one thing that I wondered whether um, people knew about, because I think that this is actually a really important relationship to the topic of ecofeminism and also how indigenous knowledge can, um, can be uh, work within a, a, even a colonial legal framework is the idea of uh, the bestowing of rivers uh, like the Wanganui River in Aotearoa uh, or New Zealand, uh, human rights. And the same push is happening now for uh, Lake Erie um, as well as as waterways uh, within Canada. And to me, I think that that's um, important because I think that it's actually mobilizing two things. It's mobilizing both indigenous knowledge as well as the power of corporations and the idea that a corporation also has the equivalency of human rights. So what happens when you start to give nature um, that same status? And of course, this comes out of particular ideologies. Um, I won't go into, into ritual specifically, but I thought that it was a really important uh, point to follow what Jessica was saying on her work. Fantastic, thank you for bringing this up. I'm sure Betsy Damon, who's I see listening to us, who's one of the artists in the exhibition, she'll be speaking next week in our conversation. I'm sure she will come back exactly to your point. Sonia, would you like to add something on that, on ritual and the meaning of it? Um. I, I think I, I would echo Aviva's um, comment because I feel like everything is kind of ritualistic, you know, like from harvesting and um, processing and creating. I mean, there is a, there's a certain way that things happen. And um, I, I, I'm, I guess I'm really into it. It's like, as far as the practice, it's, 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 it's all combined, you know. Yeah, it's, a big, it's a big word and it's a voluminous word. It's a very difficult word, a term to try to approach in short conversation. Well, one thing that Sonia, I don't know whether you would say this, but all of the work that you do from the very, very repetitive, meticulous, small things that you make that, you know, then become giant installations to others um, are incredibly labor intensive. And I wondered if in that labor, is there a sense of ritual? Definitely, I would have to say like the small little things that there's a certain mindset, it's almost meditative in some ways. And there, there is kind of a, a protocol, like a, a way of um, 
coming to it. And I think that's just the way I was raised. Like when you learn from, you know, your mom or your aunt or your sister, or whoever, you don't talk, you're not talking, you're watching, you're learning by doing, by, you know, and so that's, it's a very different, even when you're hunting, nobody, you know, no one's um, telling you X, Y, Z, you watch and you learn and you practice until you're able to do it yourself. Um, and I think that's something that's so missing in this world today is like that time spent um, listening and learning, you know, through, through action and through, um, without this conversation. It's something is lost with, with the language, I think, in a lot of places. So anyhow, it's Thank my you. mind. <laughs> Thank you. I feel bad. We, we bring in uh, too few questions. We have one minute to go, but I will read one question because we started two minutes late. So maybe we can address one more. And it's interesting. It will transport us into a very different place. Um, somebody is asking, uh, uh, referring to our last week conversation where towards the end, we actually brought the art market uh, element into this. Um, I wonder if there is time this week to elaborate. In Canada, women whose artwork is in relationship to the environment, to nature, tend to create installation pieces that are shown in artist-run centers and other non-commercial art spaces. None that I know or, uh, of refer to themselves as eco-feminists, perhaps due to the critics and critical theorists who dominate the dialogue. Critical discourse in Canada is currently mainly focused on the colonialism the colonialism as seen in part in the movement Idle No More. Uh, I'm not sure that there was a question there, but that's the difficulty in, in reading such long swaths of text while uh, listening to you. But maybe we can try to unpack what was there and, and, and refer to. Uh, Candice, could you maybe about elaborate? Sure. Um, I am Canadian. <laughs> so, and I've worked, you know, with artists and centers. And I, I would say, of course, uh, Don, as you point out, one of the biggest differences in Canada is there isn't an over-reliance on the commercial system for good or bad, uh, in part because alternative arts centers have been funded there since the 1960s as an alternative at that time to what they considered mainstream art institutions. Um, and I would also say, I, I think that you're right as well, um, decolonialism as a kind of practice is in fact being honed within the mainstream among all of us. Uh, it's almost, I would say, being used as a methodology like feminism is used as a methodology. And for me, that's transforming art institutions uh, very quickly, uh, uh, definitely in Canada. And, and that's a, ma a major thing. I think, Monica, you, you spoke about in the first, uh, in the first lecture, your term ecofeminism and how people use it. And I also understand it more from my work with Agnes Dennis, uh, uh, the, you know, her understanding of it and also the, the need to make space for this kind of very particular practice, which has its own art history. I think part of what happens in Canada is that it, like any country, I think that becomes uh, kind of more uh, insular art history that doesn't always make connections outside, even though there have been artists there since the 60s who would consider themselves feminists who've been working um, in the environment as well. Oh, yeah, I also would pick up on using the term itself because uh, when I invited artists to this exhibition, almost all of them told me, oh, don't call me ecofeminist. Don't, don't put one label on me. And I uh, completely sympathize with it. But as an art historian, as somebody who uses the pen, uh, I use words and uh, and this is my only way of making sure that women's legacy uh, goes down to the next generation and that women don't have to reinvent the wheel generation after generation. I, I spoke about it before. I, I really do think that there were fantastic painters, for example, in 19th century who were women and who were successful in their time, but then knew that the generations after didn't pick on them because nobody really cared for that legacy. And that means that it was not written about. It, um, and I think think that, you know, I could write about uh, those 16 artists in this exhibition from other perspectives as well. Nobody's practice can be defined by one word. And I hope that uh, by bringing these works into um, our attention, I'm 
I have to say that there are works in the exhibition that were not out of the storage for, deca for decades. For decades, Aviva's piece has never been presented publicly since it was made in 1973. So I would I I, I think that it's just kind of prov provocation, and I would very much like other people to pick up on this works, these artists, and address their practice from different perspectives because definitely ecofeminism is not um, an exhaustive term at all here. Um, I think it's 8.03. Uh, if anybody would like to add something, I would uh, like you to do that now. No? Well, actually, I'm just going to add something really quickly. The relationship between ritual and systems, I think they're both ways to organize experience. Some of them are the organization of actions and some of them are the organization of agents in experience, but they are both efforts on the part of humans to organize what we go through. Thank you. All right, so I think that uh, this is all for tonight. Uh, please be aware that we have one more conversation a week from now with Betsy Damon, Eliza Evans, and uh, Carla Maldonado, as well as uh, our special guest, uh, Eleanor Hartney, a critic, a writer, contributor to Art in America, and that we will convene again in the same virtual space. Uh, if anybody would like to see the exhibition, I am very careful while inviting. If you do have a safe mode of transportation to the gallery, we will believe the building and the gallery is a safe uh, space. But if you can't walk or take a bike or take your own car, uh, it, is, it is a risky business to put your no nose out there. So the exhibition is uh, quite available online. On our websites, there is plenty of text, plenty of images, and we, we hope to upload finally the uh, gallery walkthrough tomorrow. Um, you have no idea how much it is for a small gallery to take all, on, on, uh, all of it on them. And we also have to have, hope to make these uh, conversations available online as well. Thank you all so very much for accepting this invitation, for being with us and for helping to ask and helping to answer a, a small portion of the ideas that are in our heads today. Thank you. <laughs>